Okay, uh, any questions? Cool. Um, so today, a couple of things. Um, so I have, uh, I have a couple of links up here. Uh, we're gonna kind of switch um, IDEs. Uh, the, uh, so, so basically, um, how many people have heard of uh, JetBrains, IntelliJ, any of those kinds of things? Um, so IntelliJ is um, a Java IDE. Um, it's, it's a lot of people really, really like it. Um, they sort of consider it the, the best Java IDE. Um, it's made by JetBrains. JetBrains actually makes a number of IDEs, including one for dealing with, uh, with um, JavaScript and HTML and all of that. Um, and as we move into kind of doing more heavy JavaScript, um, it's actually going to be kind of handy to, uh, to use. So um, as a student, you can sign up to get a, uh, to get a free JetBrains account, which basically gives you access to all of their line of, um, of software um, essentially for free for like a year basically and then you sort of renew it each year and all that. So you can, you can sign up for your account, you can then uh, download WebStorm and all that. Um, I'm going to kind of sort of show that uh, today. So you know, here is uh, here's sort of what WebStorm looks like when uh, when it first starts up, and then you can create a project. Um, I'm all, it's already set on my desktop, and then I'm just going to set it to our usual directory here. Oh, okay, and we'll do a create. All right. So go ahead, and uh, I'll create. Uh, a couple of files here. Um, and just like brackets, it has uh, it actually it has emit and all of those kinds of things. Um, what's nice about it is, um, in addition to uh, in addition to that, it also um, will run its own uh, its own version of a server for your code. Um, some of the things that we're going to start getting into, it's going to be the case that you will need to have a, uh, a web server running even to uh, even to test your code. Um, and so we could t and, and we probably will talk about some other way of running servers on your machine. Um, this is uh, this is some quick way of, uh, of doing that. You guys see that okay or do I need to dim the lights? Didn't look, if I can find them. No, it looks. Uh, let's see. Okay, that's. That's good. Okay. That's not All right, no, see you um but if you once you signed up for your JetBrains account basically it, essentially you'll there'll be an email you whatever email address you use which actually I think you have to use your edu email address when you once you've installed it, it'll ask you to type that in. You type you type basically in the the email your email address plus your your password that you've created through JetBrains, and then you'll have access. All right. So, um, yeah. Uh, more. Right. So we need to. We're going to create an um um your your email address and you create a password. Pardon? There you go. <laughs> cool. Thank you. I did it a few weeks ago, so I don't remember. Um. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about higher order programming. Uh, then we'll talk about some graphing and things like that. Um, 
so what I wanted to, to show today is, um, one, I wanted to talk about uh, basically the, the sort of implementation or an implementation of, um, of some of those functions that we saw previously, right? So we saw the built-in map. Um, let me show you sort of one possible implementation. Um, again, it's not necessarily the implementation that is used, um, but it kind of should help you think about uh, what exactly is happening, right? So map basically uh, takes some, uh, some collection, it takes a function, um, and then basically uh, returns a new collection, a new array, that is the result of applying that function to all of the elements, okay? So um, it's fairly straightforward. I'm just going to create uh, an array called result, and ultimately we will return that result. Okay, um, and then in between we need to uh, we need to apply all of the operators. Let's see, what is it complaining? It's probably complaining about let's, not supported by this JavaScript version. Yep. Uh, let's see if I remember. It's uh, settings, and I should probably change that in the default settings too. Uh, let's see, so uh, languages and frameworks and JavaScript, and, and uh, we want ECMAScript uh, 6. There we are. And let me go ahead and make that change for the default settings as well. Bless you. Good. So we can use the uh, the latest version of uh, of JavaScript. All right. So we have our result, um, and then basically what we can do is uh, just fire up a loop, and uh, and we can have something like okay for every um, right not for every item um, in items. Uh, basically, what we're going to just do is uh, we say um, push the result of calling the function on item okay. like so. So we call whatever function was passed in um, on one of the items. We shove that into our resultant um, our result list. Okay, and so that means that uh, if we uh, if we go ahead and. Okay. So we can see, yes, it does, in fact, generate um, what we hoped it would. Okay. So let's take a look at, uh, at filter. Okay. So filter is remarkably similar to this, right? Um, basically, It's the same thing as map, except inside the, uh, inside the for loop, we're going to have an if statement as well, right? Um, so here, probably the function's better labeled something like pred, um, that is, a, that is a short for predicate, right? The predicate is a unary Boolean function, right, basically. So it's a function that takes a single parameter, um, returns true or false. Right, and remember the definition for uh, for filter is um, it's going to return the uh, the results the results um, in items that for which predicate returns true. Right, so if pred, uh, oops, sorry, yeah, if uh, pred of item. Then that. Okay. 
So we only put the result, uh, I'm sorry, we only put the item into the result if a predicate was in fact true. Okay. And again, we can try this out. Um, X and Uh, what do we get here? Let's see. Do I need extra parentheses? Shouldn't. Screw up filter. Oh, yeah. It ended up inside the for loop. Um, Fn is not defined. Yeah, probably because I did that. Um, actually, no, we don't want. This is what we want. All right. There we go. Okay. And um, then we can also get the odd ones, like so. Okay. So that's map, that's filter. Okay. Let's talk about reduce. So a couple of things. Um, I did post a small correction um, under the under the get under the code that I uploaded to GitHub regarding um, one the issue why sorting wasn't working with numbers. Also, two um, in terms of reduce, there was a, I, my code was kind of backwards in terms of the parameters that the function took. And so let's take a look at uh, at this. Um, what I'm actually going to do even before we write reduce is let's write some functions that are reduce-like um, and take a look at the overall pattern that, uh, that is going to happen, right? So we saw, for instance, that, uh, that we had, uh, that we can use reduce to sum up all of the elements in a numeric array, okay? So, all right, we have our, uh, we have our nums, um, and basically it's going to look like something like the following. I can say, okay, let's create a result, and uh, I'm going to set that equal to zero. Ultimately, I will return the result, and then again, we can have our for loop basically for every item of uh, nums. Result is equal to result plus item. Yes? Cool. How about doing the product of a list? Okay. Well, it's basically the same thing. except we start with the multiplicative identity um, and we're changing the operator that we're using here, okay. like so. Okay. And there that is. Now, um, let's see if I remember right. Yes, one more. So recall that, right, our spread operator. So the spread operator, um, remember, sort of expands out um, the, uh, the collection. Um, 
the sort of inverse of this is, and let's see if I remember right, um, is it on here? Yeah. Okay. Is join. So we can call join and uh, we can pass along basically um, a, an array and what we get is, see we get this, uh, all of the elements joined together. Now, you can also sort of uh, join and you can pass along what essentially is the separator. So, so notice if I pass the empty string, then I get back basically the original, uh, the original string. Okay? And this is really, really handy. It's very common to kind of have this collection of things you, um, all separate out into, a, into an array and you want to join them together. And again, I mean, you know, we can choose to join these um, however we want. Um, can we build this using reduce? So our initial result is the empty string. Um, ultimately, we return result. Um, again, we're going to have our uh, our for loop of thumbs, right? And um, then once again, we will do result plus um, whatever it is. Well, actually, so. Like so. Pardon? Thank you. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at that. Um, so we can do right, and we'll call our join on that and um, We'll use that as the separator, and there it is. Okay. So we can do a bunch of different things. Um, one more, just to beat a dead horse. Result is equal to item So what's the pattern? Right. It's like one of those nasty SAT or GRE questions, right? Get like two or three uh, numbers and then like what's the next four? Or, you know, you get uh, a number and then, you know, I don't know, sideways walking guy and the, uh, the symbol for prints and what's the next? Yeah, I know, it's Monday morning. Anyways. Um, so what's the pattern here? So, I mean, take a look. Every single one of them, we have some sort of result um, where we have, um, we basically have some initial value. So in the case of sum, we have value, the additive identity. In the case of result, we have multiplicative 
this reverse with empty string. Okay. Have the for for right. Ultimately, that's the thing that we are accumulating all of the uh, all of the stuff into. Right? So it gets initialized to some initial value, and we're accumulating. Okay, um, so let's generalize this, right? Um, let me kind of do it up higher, I guess, uh, right here. Okay, so our function, reduce, um, is going to take, well, the items we're going to reduce. It's going to take uh, a, uh, a function itself. Um, and it's going to take sort of an initial value. Okay, so those are the uh, those are the things that uh, that we're going to uh, that we're going to take in. Okay, then we say that our result starts off being whatever the that initial value is that was passed in. Right, and again, just like before, we say that uh, we are going to return the result. Okay. Um. And then, just like we had in the other ones, we're going to iterate over all of um, all of the items. Okay. But this time, what we're going to do is we're going to call this function, which is a binary function, on, well, so we say result is equal to the result of calling the function on result and the current item. All right. And again, so first, to sort of, but again, look at how it compares to the code that we wrote previously. Right. So here, where we were doing our summation, if we had a if we had a prefix version of addition. This is what it would look like, right? Again, same type of thing, same type of thing, etc. Okay, so we simply uh, we simply keep accumulating in result the result of calling this uh, this binary function on it. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so we load this up. Um, we have our version of reduce. Um, so let's double check that uh, we can sum all of those, right? So we know then that we need um, ac and um, n. Um, and so that's just uh, followed by zero. Um, to multiply all these things together, it's that. To do our join, um, plus so I'll just hard code our uh, separator in here. And then, of course, our, uh, our version of reverse, uh, which basically was um, so that's the power of reduce. Um, and furthermore, 
remember that um, in, the, in the actual version of Reduce that's built into JavaScript, that, um, that initial value is actually optional. If you don't um, pass in the initial value, what happens basically is that the that binary function is first called on the first two elements of um, of the array. Okay, so basically you can sort of skip over providing an initial value and just say, oh, okay, grab the first two elements, apply that, and then continue on um, from there. Okay, so reduce is a very very powerful. Um, paradigm in terms of programming, right? So much so um, that a little company called Google makes use of it for their main business purposes, right? Google is known for what? Searching, right? They're primarily or initially a search engine. So how do you build a search engine? Right? I mean, when you type in whatever your search terms are, and Google gives you back that list, most of which is porn, how does that happen? We didn't think of it. Keebler elves, fairy dust, what? So do, does Google employ a bunch of people who spend all day long surfing the web to generate these results? No, they don't. <laughs> right. What do they do? They have programs that do that for them. Right? So they first and foremost wrote programs that all the program does is surf the web. Okay? It's basically your average 12 year old. Just sits there surfing the web all day long, never getting tired, never coming out of its bedroom. Okay? But on top of that, basically sort of keeps notes of everything that's listed inside there. You think they generate a little bit of data from this? Okay. So once they get all that data of here's a page with these particular terms, and so they got to kind of do further indexing and all these other kinds of stuff, right? So they need a way of processing massive amounts of data. And the paradigm that they use for that algorithm is map and reduce. In fact, it's called map reduce. Right. Um, and so a few years ago, there was a paper actually put out by uh, the Google team talking about how they use map reduce. And because of the fact that they're using pure functions, they can sort of deal with all this scale and rapidly paralyze, parallelize things and so forth. Um, and again, like Amazon, who realized, hey, you know, we have this infrastructure that other people might want to use. Um, Google, in doing this, uh, basically spurned um, something called Hadoop. How many people have heard of Hadoop? Right. Hadoop is an open source map reduce architecture uh, for basically doing massively parallel computation using essentially the map reduce paradigm. Okay. Again, and it just comes down to this stuff, map and reduce. Okay. But because they are functional, because there's no side effects, you can very easily run those jobs on hundreds or thousands of machines all at the same time um, to process very large sets of data. Okay. So that's that stuff. All right. Um, so there'll be a homework assignment um, on some of this to kind of get you to kind of play around with those things and, and, and all. Um, let's talk about some other stuff. So last time uh, I showed some stuff with, uh, with Google's chart API, and we haven't forgotten about that. That's coming too. Um, so let's actually start talking about uh, some of that stuff. Um, so as we move to the web, 
Uh, like everything in programming, okay, the, the question you should always ask is, has somebody else already built this for me? Right? Preferably an open source, a group of open source authors, so that that way I don't have to pay for this and all that. Okay? Why? I mean, why? Why do we, apart from the fact that we're just lazy, which is actually a good thing according to Larry Wall. Remember, the cardinal virtues of programmers, laziness, hubris, and impatience. Okay? It's good to be lazy. But why? I mean, why do we really want to find somebody else who did all that stuff? Yeah, right? I mean, presumably they've put in the blood, sweat, and tears for testing it um, and making sure that it works, right? Bottom line, programming is hard. Okay. Just ask my IT data structure students. Anyways, that's another thing. All right, so programming's hard. If somebody else basically built what it is that we want to do, or most of the way, we might want to actually sort of try to find out about that and figure out a way of exploiting that. Okay? In the worst case scenario, we've got to roll our own. Um, it's a bit of an oversimplification. I mean, sometimes it's the case that, yeah, you have various choices. A lot of times you have various choices from um, what people have built um, for you. The problem is then you have to start to figure out how it is that they think about solving problems and you end up with these uh, frameworks and so forth that are um, what they call opinionated, uh, where basically they force you into a particular mindset of thinking about, uh, thinking about solving problems. And sometimes that doesn't match with uh, other stuff that you're doing. Okay. But nevertheless, on the web, we've got lots of stuff built for us. Tons of stuff built for us. Um, both in the way of things like JavaScript libraries, as well as we'll see also things like web APIs, um, that is, endpoints that we can connect to to, um, to, have, uh, to to access data, to access other services, and so forth, right? And again, being able to sort of tie those things together um, is a good portion of, uh, of what, uh, what modern web workers uh, basically have to deal with, okay? So we're going to start talking about using, uh, using Google's Charts API um, just as, as one such example of making use of an API and playing around further with our JavaScript skills and so forth. Um, I hope to also talk a little bit about their mapping API. That's pretty cool, too. Um, but yeah, there's a bunch of these kinds of APIs and so forth. Um, the other thing that we're going to move into, I'm not going to talk about it quite today, um, but we will definitely talk about um, the most popular JavaScript um, library. Anybody know it? jQuery, yes. Okay, so jQuery, um, as I said, is the most popular um, is the most popular JavaScript library. It is like uh, it's basically like putting regular JavaScript on steroids. Um, it's a lot of the features that uh, JavaScript should have just had built into them, uh, built into it, but didn't, and uh, and so jQuery takes it to the next level. Um, periodically, what I do is. Um, Especially when I'm, whenever I'm teaching a class that I haven't taught in a little bit, or even when I pick up another class that I have been teaching, um, I'll go through the, I'll typically go through the job ads for that sort of material. Um, invariably, you cannot find a web position that does not mention JavaScript as one of the things that, uh, I'm sorry, jQuery as one of the things that, uh, that one should know. Um, in terms of that stuff. So, uh, so knowing about that, um, again, good stuff. And we're going to talk about that, just not today. Okay. So, uh, so Google, basically, if you, if you Google Google Charts API, okay, you, uh, you come up with, uh, with this site here. And so what the Charts API is, is as you can see, they have, uh, they have these various, uh, these various um, ways of displaying data graphically, right? So different types of charts and so forth. Um, and so, you know, you can go to like, for instance, the chart gallery and see all the different kinds of charts and so forth that, uh, that Google uh, basically has stuff already built for you to use. 
Okay. Again, we could build these things ourselves out of out of a raw JavaScript, but why? Um, and you can see here, you know, here's a whole sort of list of the various charts and and so forth. Okay. So. Lots of stuff are uh, basically um, built in, and it's just a matter of kind of figuring out how to do it. Now, what's nice too is um, is so when you go so here, for instance, I have a, I have a bar charts. Um, they'll actually show you you know a bunch of different examples and so forth, um, and you can actually see the uh, the the code for doing just that. So, for instance, um, here if I click on this little link that says uh, "Code it yourself on JS Fiddle." Anybody played with? Uh, JS Fiddle or one of these types of things. Okay, so what it is, in case you haven't, uh, in case you haven't played with it, um, it's an online. There, there's a number of these sort of online sites where you can um, quickly code up. Notice HTML, CSS, JavaScript here, and here's the result. Okay, so I, this is a this is a live page that we can actually edit directly. Um, for instance, you know, if I wanted to change uh, this here, uh, and let's see, oh yes, here's the run button, right? And so now that's uh, been changed to um, like a, like so. Okay, um, or we can uh, drastically reduce the population of New York City, um, like so. Look at that, one little edit and we've killed millions of people. Oh, the power at our disposal. Okay. Um, so what's nice about uh, JS Fiddle and these things, I mean, they're, hand, they're handy little sandboxes for kind of uh, trying out different ideas and so forth real quick um, in terms of playing with that stuff. Okay, so let's kind of take a look at uh, at, at some of this stuff um, at using these different things and so forth. Um, I'm just going to create it here, so I'll create a, uh, a new HTML file. I'll call it uh, barchart.html. And uh, let's see. So we'll come over here. So um, if we take a look at one, what I, what I actually want to show you is, is we're going to kind of do a modification of um, of this graph here, um, predominantly because this will start to give you a hint for that uh, that whole uh, name surfer thing that I was showing. Um, that as I said, it's a coming. <laughs> um, so here, um, the idea is that they that not only are they they showing um, multiple cities, they're basically showing sort of multiple um, multiple population uh, population readings, right? So we see, for instance, we have the 2010 population reading, a 2000 population reading, etc. Okay. Um, now they show kind of roughly how to load this up. I'm going to show you a slightly different way again. That's that's going to um, go along a bit nicer with uh, with what you're going to be doing um, in uh, in the assignment directly. Okay, so for dealing with uh, with job with uh, Google's chart API, first and foremost, you need to uh, you need to load up the uh, the JavaScript for that, right? And that basically is just this. It's just loading up um, the uh, the loader itself. And again, I mean, they show you exactly this in all of their stuff. They show it actually in the, in the sort of quick start and, and all those kinds of things. Um, so basically, first and foremost, you just load up, uh, load up that particular library. Um, then you also need some element that is ultimately going to be um, that is going to be the chart itself on your page. Okay, we're just going to create a div, um, and uh, and you'll notice they actually so they actually do this um, right here. They have a they have a div. You can the ID you can use whatever ID that you want. Um, I'm going to I'll just use uh, the ID that they use. Like so. Okay, so that div ultimately will become our chart on the screen. Okay. All right. Then we got to write some code to kind of load this stuff up. Okay. So just again, so we can kind of make sure that everything's uh, going fine. Right. So you know, I can load up my uh, my chart here. Yeah. There's my console. I don't have any errors. Notice I don't have a chart yet. Um, but yeah, certainly I do have uh, I do have the stuff. Right. There's our chart so far, which is not really much of a chart at all. Okay. All right. <clears throat>
Okay. So, what we're going to do, um, let's see, is this the one? No. Okay. Um, so, what we'll do here is you'll notice that, you know, one way of generating the, uh, the chart the the chart itself in um, in terms of uh, in terms of of this is to uh, is to use this array to data table helper uh, method or function um, and that's great if you have all the data right when the page loads and you want to show all of the data um, at that time. On the other hand, in name surfer, you'll remember basically initially we sort of see an empty chart or no chart, and then as the person selects names, those particular names get added to the chart. So something like uh, like what's happening here isn't really going to fit um, what you would need to do in that uh, in that regard. Okay, so we'll need to uh, we'll need to actually um, we'll need to kind of build that up a little bit differently. Okay, um, first I'm going to load up uh, I'm going to load up this JavaScript here, okay. Um, the, uh, the load method, basically you can see it's loading up the, uh, the core chart package and since we're using a bar chart, um, it's going to load up that as well. Again, if you look at the documentation for each of the different kinds of charts, it basically will show you what type of, uh, what type of load to, uh, to use in terms, of, uh, in terms of what you're going to use. Um, then typically you'll see um, a call like this, the set on load callback. Um, so here basically you're just providing the name of a function that's going to draw your chart okay so oops I'm sorry so that means we need a function with that name and again we can call it whatever we want um, so we'll go with that so the draw mult series all right so as I said if we had all of the the data sort of statically, we could use uh, we could use something like the array to uh, to data table. Okay, um, but generally we're not going to have that. Um, at least in in your assignment, you're not going to have that. So we're going to do it a little bit differently. Okay, so what we'll say is um, we will create data itself, and we'll use the uh, more modern let, um, and we will do that saying new Google um, visualization. Uh, data table. Okay. So that creates an empty data table for us okay. with nothing. Okay. Then we need to basically add um, what are called columns for uh, the particular data that we want to store. So in this case, if we go back to here, okay, if you take a look at our data, let me make this a little bit bigger. So we can see, for instance, one of the columns that we have, basically the first column that we have is, um, is the cities themselves. Okay? So when you add a column, the first thing you need to do is you're telling the chart API what the type of the data is that you're going to store in that column. In this case, it's just strings, right? So we use type string, and then basically we can give a, uh, a name for that, right? So this is, uh, this is the name of the, uh, the cities. Okay. Then uh, we'll add another column. Um, and so I'll add, uh, let's say, the, uh, the first column here for, um, for the, uh, the 2010 population data. Okay. In that case, um, it is number. Okay. Now, again, let me just show you. Um, wait, is it? Oh, that's higher order. I don't need that one. I want this one. Okay. Still ain't got no chart or grammar apparently. Okay. So um, let's see about uh, about actually displaying a uh, um, some sort of chart on the screen if possible. Uh, so what we want to do. 
cheat sheet here. There it is. Okay. So, we create a chart calling the bar chart constructor. Notice we need to uh, we need to pass in the div that uh, that essentially is going to uh, is going to be our um, our chart itself. Okay. So here we're simply using the document get element by ID to search for that particular um, that particular div. Um, then we have uh, then we say we're going to go ahead and draw the chart. We pass along our data and then options that I haven't created yet. Okay, so let me go ahead and uh, create an empty options for right now. So this hopefully. Yeah, you're right. I do need two. Okay. I have two equal signs? Thank you. Yes. Okay. So there's our empty chart. Okay. Now, um, let's talk about the options and positioning this and so forth. Okay, so um, for instance, there is, um, you'll notice actually, again, if you refer back to, uh, to the fiddle, uh, they actually specify a whole bunch of different options. And in fact, there are, there are quite a number of options that, uh, that you can specify um, for things. So for instance, if I wanted my chart a little bit smaller, um, I could add in this particular option. Okay. Incidentally, what options is, anybody know? It's JSON. Yeah, it is JSON, but what else? So what does JSON stand for? Yes, JavaScript. JavaScript object notation. This is an object literal. Okay. If you come from languages like C, C++, Java, there's no comparison. This doesn't exist in those languages. Okay. So this is literally an object that has a single field named chart area. Um, that chart area is an object itself that has um, right now one field called width that is set to the string 50%. Okay. All right, so let's uh, take a look at, uh, at that. And we see. There it is. Made it small. Oh, the, oh yes, right. So if you're getting the, if you're getting the error about uh, about the JavaScript version, um, you can go to File and Settings, and you'll go to under Languages and uh, and Frameworks, select JavaScript, and here where it says uh, JavaScript language version, yours it probably I think it's it probably says something like 5.1. You want to change it to ECMAScript 6, and then click OK, um, and then it should be fine. Okay, so um, so we have something up on the screen. And again, just to kind of give you an idea of, uh, of your various options and so forth, right? So again, you know, if you come through, I think actually it'll, try to remember. Customizing charts, axis options. Yes, 
so you can create stacked bar uh, stacked bars um, custom charts probably in here nope someplace here there's a giant table that shows like that shows all of the options um, so I leave it to you to find it <laughs> all right okay so um, notice we have uh, we start to be able to, to configure our uh, our options and so forth um, so once we do that uh, then we can actually start uh, start adding data to um, to our chart as well okay so for doing that um, ultimately what you want is the add row function okay so the add row function or the add row method um, allows us to add new data to um, to the chart itself. So, for instance, if I came over here and I um, we take a look at uh, at that particular chart that we were dealing with um, right here, okay, uh, we could start actually adding in our data um, or at least the initial parts of our data. So, for instance, I can grab I'll just grab this, and you'll notice that basically it's going to take an array. For um, for our data, right? So for each part, um, it takes an array. Um, basically, the number of columns is the same as the number of columns that we have already set up for the uh, for the data table, right? So here I have uh, I have two columns, and so I'm going to need to specify uh, two elements in my um, in my add row. Okay. So for doing that, um, let's take a look, and there it is. Um, then let's add in the additional data. Okay, so let me go ahead and grab these. And data. And there they are. Okay. Questions about this much? Yes. Is it just going by the order you put it in, intelligently? Yeah, it's actually. I mean, the, I, I believe the bar chart basically right is 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 doing just that. So, for instance. Um, Um, and there's additional, so in the options and in various other things you can do, um, you can style up all of these things. And again, I mean, you can actually sort of take a look to see, uh, oops, can I, oops, let me, there we are. Right, so we can kind of see the various stuff that basically has been added in dynamically by Google's, um, by Google's JavaScript, right? So they added in this other stuff, and again, you can kind of sort of drill down and so forth. Okay, we're doing on time. Let's start it and see how far we can get. We have about 16 minutes. Okay, so let's make this kind of dynamic. That is, we'll add a button to the page um, to allow us to, uh, when we click the button, basically to add the additional data to, um, to our chart. So, um, okay. 
All right, so here's our, uh, here's our button itself, um, not really doing much of anything. Now, we can, um, we can attach to, uh, to the button itself, um, and I'm going to actually do that up in here. And I'll explain why in a minute. All right, so, yeah, that's good. So there's our get element by ID for uh, for grabbing hold of the button. All right, and let's just make sure that uh, that we are in fact uh, getting the button. Okay, and yeah, we do. Right, so we do actually get our handle to um, to the button itself. Um, then from there uh, we can add in. our event listener, which is a function like so. Okay. Right. And you notice it sort of keep it just keeps adding this because I'm basically printing the uh, the same text. So it's it's a little uh, optimization that uh, that Google's uh, console basically is uh, is doing for us okay so we've created a button we can actually have um, have that function itself um, called when uh, when the buttons clicked okay so we're good yes good 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 okay. <laughs> now here's the thing I talked before about, uh, about this idea of lambda functions and anonymous functions um, and mentioned that, uh, that a lot of languages um, that did not have these originally have in fact added them in. Um, C++ and Java are two such examples. Now, while, while we've seen already or hopefully you've started to begin to appreciate that lambdas in and of themselves uh, can be fairly useful. Um, really what people were most excited about was the idea of closures. C-L-O-S-U-R-E. Okay. Um, I spell it because there's also a programming language named closure spelled with a J, not an S. Um, so this notion of closures um, basically has to do with scoping of variables. And here's the kind of interesting thing that you can do. So take a look. Right here on line 28, I'm in a function and I'm referring to a variable named chart. That variable is, well, the, what we say technically about it is that variable um, is unbound in this particular scope. There is no chart global variable either. Lexically, the closest variable is right there. So the function in which this anonymous function is declared has declared the chart variable. And our anonymous function has closed over that variable. 
Notice, our anonymous function can refer to those local variables of the function in which it was declared. And the reason that's cool is because in here, I'm going to have to manipulate the chart. Right? I'm going to have to actually go back to the chart, deal with the data, for instance, and add in a new column, add some additional rows, all of those kinds of things. Now, without this ability, I'd probably have to have some sort of weird global sitting around and all of that. Here, I don't have to do any of that. I don't have to have global data. All I have to do is close over that local variable. Okay. So that's really cool, very powerful. All right, <clears throat> so, um, so not only do we have access to that, we also have access to, um, to data. Right, and so we can see, yeah, there that is. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so the first thing that we're gonna do is we add a column to the data, and that's another number column, and this one is the 2000 population. Now, it is actually changing it, um, we're just not seeing it. Why? Because if we've made a change to the chart, we actually have to, uh, have to draw the chart again as well. So let's do that. See? So we have access to data, we have access to chart, and we have access to options. Again, we've closed over all of those variables. Now, of course, I do have this slight problem. Um, so we may need to sort of fix that. Uh, but notice, we can dynamically change the, uh, change the chart. Now let's look at, um, at basically sort of adding in, um, adding in some of the rest of this. Okay, now add row isn't going to help necessarily unless I basically grab kind of the new data. Um, or I'm sorry, I grab the old data together with, uh, with the new data that I want. Okay? Really what I want to be able to do is we can think about you know, this, this data table as a grid. And so really kind of what I want to do is go to you know, this, this, new, this newly created column and be able to, uh, to specify elements directly for that. Okay? Which is, let's see, I'll have it in front of me there. Hopefully I can remember offhand, data set, I think it's set. Uh, set, uh, darn it. Let me search it quick. Ah, there it is. Set cell. Okay, so it takes um, a row number and a column number. Okay, so zero, one, two, so it should be two. Um, and then a data point, right? So, um, for, so as we see here, uh, let's see. So the 2000 population of, uh, of New York City was that, right? And then I could do uh, data set cell. Uh, let's see. So then we want that still, um, still column two and um, this. Um, okay, so let's just check that so far. All right, so I reload that. I hit that. Yeah. Okay, so let's get our other ones in there. Um, so we can do data set cell um, two, two, and uh, let's see, that was uh, this one here. Oop, nope. <laughs> And uh, this one here. All 
Okay. And six minutes. So since we have six minutes, let's do... Let's add a little polish. Um, the Google charts support animation. Um, and let's see, yeah, there it is. It's uh, options, animation, there it is. This is pretty much what I want. So under options, which is here. Okay. Um, so I'm saying, okay, uh, we're going to animate things. Uh, we will animate over the duration, over basically a duration of one second. Um, easing has a number of different values. So you can kind of take a look at that. Um, but uh, what this will do is, so first of all, when you'll, you should notice when I load this up, there is no animation. If you want initial animation, there's another option under the animation settings um, for doing just that. Um, but this should now allow me to animate, which it did, like so. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so that's it for today. I will see you next time. Next time we'll kind of talk about um, manipulating the data further, reading that from the server, etc. Um, and all that. <clears throat>